Pinoy ka, Pinoy. Kita sa mundo. You know, because of how I speak and how I look, people ask me a lot, like, oh, so where are you from? And I have to go on to this very long um, explanation, which is, uh, actually, I was born in Baguio, um, and I, I lived in Angeles my whole life, but I also studied in Manila. But right now, I just live in the moment. You know? Please don't cancel me for that. Oh! Hi. I didn't see you there. Welcome back to Doghouse Live. The show where we yell about the things that we love, but like productively. Catch us out on our YouTube channel. I'm Chloe, your underdog host. And I made mochi recently. I'm really proud of that. I've been cooking it since like, lockdown, so... Proud. In this episode, we'll be unpacking word that was meant to be inclusive, but instead, it shed light on the great divide between the diaspora and homeland Filipino experiences. Today, we're talking about Philippinex. Let me break it down. My phone's gonna break down first, I guess. I actually don't know how to beatbox, so... Here's the breakdown. When it was added to dictionary.com, it caused an uproar from the online community and the rift formed between us here and our kababayans overseas, particularly in the United States of America. What was meant to be a safe space for one culture felt like an affront to another, with arguments about how Filipino was already a gender-neutral term in and of itself. However, it was rebutted by statements of how Filipino was birthed from colonization. So the question now is, how do we balance the conversation for two sides who are dealing and speaking through their own oppressions. So, let's bring in our guests. First, we have Nick Feliciano, who's a writer, an actor, director, and a cook, born in Manila but now based in Berkeley, California. When she's not deep in theater projects with Bindle Shift Studios, the only theater in the U.S. dedicated to Filipino and Philippine X America Performing Arts, you can find her in the streets of Oakland selling shrimp with sub street food. <laughs> Hello, Nick. Thank you for coming. Hi. On the show. Thank you for being here. How are you there? Um, how's how's the weather? I don't know what else to ask. We're still living in this uh, shit show that is America right now, and it's. I don't know whether to laugh or cry, <laughs> but <laughs> hanging in there. <laughs> so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Our next guest is Adrian Ondai, who is currently doing their graduate studies in sociology hoping to focus on the many ways we organize ourselves beyond the imposition of dominating forces. They also organize spaces of conversation as part of the Usapang Lalaki community, which believes that we can only understand our different experiences and struggles when we hold our judgment to listen and talk face-to-face. -face. Hi, Adrian! Hi! <laughs> Hi, thanks for being here! Thanks for having me! Super excited for this conversation. Ooh. So, truthfully, we need to accept that we are in, we're in our own echo chambers on social media. We see what we want to see. So, being surrounded by people who are for or against Philippine X means we only ever see it represented by one side. So, to our Philippine X, where did the movement come from? This is just my, th my from what I understand it to be, is I think that, so the term Filipinex originally came from or was inspired by Latinx. Here in America, like identity is like such a big part of your existence, especially if you're if you're an immigrant or if you're a person of color, you're you're like constantly having to figure out who you you know, who you are, what you represent, that kind of a thing. And so I think Latinx was a more of an academic term that was um that was introduced i believe by some queer latino um activists in academia and they came up with this term as a way to question spanish and like kind of latin languages and how that leaves out non-binary people and 
and that kind of a thing. And I think the X came probably from, I'm guessing, from Chicano, which is what a lot of young Mexican activist um, folks here in the States refer to themselves as, uh, like Mexican Americans, essentially. And X is really common in the indigenous languages where they're from, like, you know, like the Mayans and Aztecs or whatever the indigenous languages are in Mexico, there's a lot of X's. And so I think that's kind of where it came from, you know, generally came from academia to put language sort of behind movements and what, so that you know kind of how to organize and what work needs to be done to either gain equality or that kind of a thing. It's, it's sort of like an in and out conversation from what I'm seeing online at least. Like, it, I think it was first posted mm -hmm. in around 2017 or at least that was the time I could like mm -hmm. see it farthest. Recently at least, that's when I saw a resurgence of it. But it also came in and out of conversation like in the past few months or yeah. years. I actually don't know time anymore. Yeah, but. definitely. <laughs> yeah. I, de I definitely noticed that as well. And I think, you know, just... <laughs> When you're underrepresented, you sort of hang on to the studies and the pop, you know, the ways that that other folks fight oppression here in the U.S. to try to reconcile what my person, my personal stance on it, is that a lot of Filipino Americans aren't raised with like a consciousness of home, you know? So I feel very lucky that I do. And so when it comes to things like this, I personally like to default to home, you know? Like if the queer kids at home think it's crazy, it doesn't fit the culture. We already understand that the Galo or, you know, that our languages are generally non-binary and they're not gendered. Then I understand the argument about that. Um, but I also understand why it's necessary for inclusion here in America. Like, you know, our theater, when they put out an announcement and they add the X in the Philippinex, then it signals to like other queer kids from all over that this is potentially a safe space, that they can come here and they don't have to worry about being, you know, feminine if they're a man or like, you know, like all those kinds of things. So like lately, I will say, if I mean Filipino, like from home, I say Filipino, I say Pinoy, whatever. I don't think about it. But when I say Filipino American, that's when I'm more inclined to add the X. People who have least access or people who are, tend to be more oppressed, to me, have the louder voice. So that's how I try to weigh controversial things. Like who has, who has the most to gain or who has the most to lose. Mm -hmm. And generally, I try to listen to. Who, yeah, that's very so it's a lot of context then, stuff. No? But that's kind of my take. You could share a bit more information on it. Um, so mm -hmm. she uh, moved to America at around 10, 11 years old, uh, or turned 11 mm -hmm. in America. And, and you've yeah, been so also visiting mm -hmm. back and forth, right? OK. Again, for the viewers at home, Adrian's from Manila. So uh, I'm curious about when you at least start, like first heard of the movement or your, you know, your thoughts on it. I uh, actually heard it uh, around the same time you did. So it was like um, in and out mm -hmm. of like Tumblr, Twitter mostly, I think. And I wasn't really aware of like what this word meant. I thought it was like off fancy Tumblr thing because it was a Tumblr they often use like different words and I'm like hmm what does kin mean? Mga ganon. Uh, I think the resurgence of it was like about a year or so ago for me and that was when I actually started reading uh, a bit more about it so I'm not an expert on it clearly but it's something that uh, I slowly gained interest in I guess and gaining like friends from the diaspora in the US uh, really gave me better insights on it but like before this totally i was super um i was a lot like the people who really like got mad on facebook because of the dictionary issue so my mindset was really parang uh i don't think this word is necessary ganyan uh meron naman tayong parang gender neutral na language nga blah 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 so i wasn't really understanding where these people were coming from i didn't know anyone from uh the filipino-american community in the u.s because i have relatives in the u.s but 
they're really like way older than me, like lola ko, tita ko, ganyan. So they wouldn't really be like hip and up to date with like all the terminologies anymore. But uh, yeah, uh, in the beginning, I was super judgmental and like biased against uh, Filipinx as a term. Um, I was thinking na, ayun nga, uh, it's unnecessary. Uh, maybe they didn't talk to people in the um, homeland or in the archipelago before that or whatever. But then as I slowly um, understood uh, the complexities, not just of um, the Filipino identity and Filipinex identity, but even like the larger context of American politics, Western politics, globalization, I slowly came to understand that, yeah, um, having an identity based uh, and ties based on your ethno-linguistic um, background from where you migrated from ganyan would actually make you feel like super adrift in a context where no one is like you or very few people are like you so understanding that it was basically the same uh, for me, in the sense na sa Manila naman, or sa NCR in general, there are a lot of people from the province who migrate to Manila for better opportunities, looking for jobs, ganyan. But when you ask them, like, oh, ano ka, saan ka galing, or like, how they identify as, sa Pilipinas, um, they prefer really to identify based on their region then. Eh. So, ah, Bicolano ako, Bisaya ako. So it's, for me, um, putting it in that sort of context or understanding or lens na it might not be exactly the same process and um, struggle uh, as the Filipinex. It gave me more, I, uh, I guess, perspective and understanding na, uh, yeah, maybe we're really trying to hold on to uh, something that's super important that's part of us because when we're thrown into a space na hindi natin alam kung anong meron we don't know a lot of people we don't know exactly where we are we're mostly lost for the most part especially it's like having something that you identify with that you hold close to your heart and that you know um, some people might understand the experience and um, I guess um, culture of would really help ground you. Eh. So grounding ourselves is super necessary in especially in the context of like mm. social political upheaval and struggle. Eh. So kumbaga sa US I feel like it's a never ending struggle. Like you're from a foreign country or you're from a background that isn't recognized the ba as like the majority or the acceptable identity in your space. You're gonna flock towards people who would understand the kinds of struggle you have. And so um, that's grounding kasi alam mo na na validate yung experiences mo. Alam mo na I'm not wrong for feeling this way, de ba ganyan. And that's a lot of what identity does for us. Eh. It really validates us, it um, ensures na um, you know who you are, you know where or what you come from, and using that as your kumbaga, your anchor, it helps you, um, kumbaga, it's something that you can come back to whenever you feel lost, whenever you feel like um, you don't know what direction to take. If you haven't watched the previous episode, episode 2, LGBTQIA plus narratives, um, I'm, I'm personally, I, I do identify as non-binary, but I also, you know, I'm here. You know, parang geographically, my context is here. And being raised and living in the province, parang to me, it was always, like, as, as Adrian said, no, it, like, Filipino in general <laughs> is, like, has that gender neutralness, like, even with, like, saying siya as a pronoun. Um, so, so, to me, it was, like, very similar, like, Honest, honestly, <laughs> um, it was like difficult for me to grasp initially. Parang like, oh, but Filipinos already gender neutral. Like growing up, that's that's how I understood it or how it was used around me. So it was really like, oh, but I, uh, okay, <laughs> you know. For me, in the province at least, parang like my dysphoria wasn't as bad until I had to learn English, which is a very gendered language like with pronouns wise and um i also researched a bit like i was i was talking someone on youtube joke lang that's 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 wrong i didn't wasn't stalking but i was i was watching some youtubers um and the one i was watching was uh simply nail logical <laughs> so christine um and parang there was like this conversation in the comment section talking about like one of the questions she posed, which was, how do people in, you know, who use gendered languages like French, how do they refer to themselves, um, you know, especially the non-binary 
uh, identifying people because uh, so I found out just to share <laughs> share this information that I found a lot of them in France use like the adjective form of uh, the words they use because those are more gender neutral compared to the gendered the more gendered words I feel like it's one of the first times that Filipinos here and Filipinos back home were in conversation about something mm -hmm. which which was one of the which was one of the things that drew me to the conversation and also parang inspired me to you know really ex talk to my cousins and you know find out like what well, what do you what do you all think out there you know and that kind of a thing and i'm just I'm, I have to say that that is the silver lining because it has always been my dream. Um, I do believe that Filipinos have a global identity. Like, I would not survive my life here if I didn't feel and identify as first Panay. And then there's so, there's so much to be gained, I think, from both sides. Um, to be able to come together more and to be able to see each other in each other. That's so interesting, uh, eh? Cause like, oh, sorry, cause I like the uh, when you brought it up, nga, na, parang it's the first time that they've really been in conversation. The super ironic thing is like, I'm not saying everyone, I'm not saying like majority, but a lot of Filipinos actually have relatives from other countries. So there's conversation going on, but it's on an individual level. It's not on. Uh, sort of like a community level where kumbaga, we have this national narrative which is like oh OFWs are heroes, mga bayani sila, I mean, you know that whole rhetoric. I feel like Filipinx have um, a better notion and understanding of what the experiences mm -hmm. of the archipelago are like compared to what Filipinos in the archipelago have any idea at all of like experiences but, out there. But dun, dun rin ako medyo naiinis if I'm honest you guys. Kasi when I read those conversations, there's an air that Filipinx kids have that I would love, you know, whenever I do talk to my friends, I would love to tone down a notch. Like, you know, I was educated here. I got my degree in America. I have a lot of thing. I have a lot of thoughts about how things go. But the Philippines is a different consciousness you know it's not something that you can always cleanly apply what you learned here and apply it to life there that just it's not gonna reconcile you know it's so yeah. it's so different i really wish that like more filipino like diaspora kids would kind of take the back seat to the to a lot of these conversations and allow folks from home to really have a voice in it because I agree with you like Adrian like there's that's been lacking for all this for for such a long time you know and I think like the Filipino Americans who are privy to this language already is a marker that they have been radicalized they have had access to educate to some form of a doesn't have to be a formal education but they've had access to you know information from the civil rights movement here there's like you know, there's all these things. And so we already know how to, like, you know, here it's important for us to uplift, like, voices that aren't heard or that aren't represented. So poor, black, you know, people of color. We already know that that's part of the conversation. I just hope that more Filipino Americans extend that same mindfulness to Filipinos from home when they're engaging in these conversations because that was the thing that was just really pissing me off. I'm like, my God, like they just, like we come off like on such a fucking high horse and it's like, shut up, like listen, you know, sorry. We have a, we, we're, you know, I think we have, we're tribal, you know, like we're a tribal people. We feel akin to, I mean, we feel once you get out of the Philippines, like, you can feel another Filipino from like my like I can be I can be on this side of the store and a tita can be like all the way across from the store and I'll know that there's another Filipino person in this room you know so we have this energy that is just familiar and um and so I, I was really disappointed to to see how some of these conversations were going because it did seem so like 
short-sighted on the part of Filipino Americans um, and the understanding that they really we need to we need to listen you know we need to listen and uplift you know like there's so much access to information and different kinds of things that I don't when we have these conversations I feel like it's important for Filipino Americans to not lose sight of that privilege and calm mm. the fuck down <laughs> <laughs> uh, that also similarly applies to the context of Filipinos talking about this topic. So, parang the Philippinex issue, I feel, is such a good conversation to have. But at the same time, Filipinos don't have authority. They don't have the expertise to speak about Philippinex experiences and like what labels they could use. So, kung parang what Nick was saying kanina, you can turn it on its own head because it's also applicable to how we Filipinos deal with it. So, parang if uh, Filipino American kids have that sort of um, ano ba, parang feeling of superiority where they think they know better when they speak about issues of Filipinos in the archipelago. Uh, on the other side, naman, Filipinos don't have expertise on diasporic experiences. So, parang, how would you expect someone who doesn't know what it feels like diba, to talk about something with so much authority? Like, I know that um, the Filipino identity is such a it's really such an important thing, especially for us na parang, uh, as a nation, kumbaga, it's like the only thing we have going for us, kumbaga, it's like how you see when someone sings on like some American TV show and you're like, oh, Filipino, mm. kahit parang one-fourth lang siyang Filipino or something, parang ganon. So parang, there's this feeling na, na uh, we always, always have to check our privilege, kumbaga, in the sense, like, really, like, learn to be reflexive, to contextualize, and understand mm -hmm. what conversation is going on. Because, hindi natin pwedeng, like, pagpilitan ng sarili natin na parang tayo yung maalang if we really mm -hmm. don't know anything about what we're talking That's about. So, like, true. it goes That's both so ways, talaga, I think. With my understanding of what the diaspora is, parang it's like the fracturedness of it. Because, diba, like, the culture is different from America, the American Filipino diaspora versus here in the Philippines. There, there's a big difference there. But even within the country itself, like, like even the very simple word langgam, it's like different. Like it's a bird, but then it's the ant langgam. So like even in that sense, there's already such a big difference and split. Um, so that's um, or even like within Manila. Like I feel like I feel the traffic makes Manila feel so much bigger. But <laughs> you know, uh, even like on the please correct me if I am wrong. Please fact check me, Adrian, because you're the sociology person here. But <laughs> like with how I see it, like the people who you know, let's say people from Marikina or like the, the I don't know geography either, so please <laughs> um but you know, people from Marikina have very different like living from Pasig or even um, Alabang. Because I'm from the province. I'm from Pampanga. Um, mga Pampangueños, you know. Um, hey. Please don't ask me to speak in Kapampangan. But um, when I when I went to college in Ateneo, people were talking to me about this prom D term, and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> what the heck is that? Like prom D? And I was like, and yeah. someone like, yeah. no, like not joking, someone asked me in a very serious tone, like, Oh, so how'd you get here? Like, did you ride the carabao? Like, wow. <laughs> Sir, never speak to me again. Damn. <laughs> like, is this for real? Did I hear this right? Like, we have better roads than you in Clark. Don't talk to me right <laughs> now. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's interesting in that sense na even, even like on a provincial basis for me with my experience, parang there's already uh, like the idea of the province versus like the actual province itself. There's like that splitting already. You have to pay attention to context to in order mm. to to feed your free thinking brain. Like we're so set up right now to just make quick decisions. I agree, I don't agree. Like, you know, we have the way that we consume media mm -hmm. is like so quick and so fast and it's like you have to have a mm -hmm fully formed opinion about a thing like with that speed of like i agree or i disagree it's with the context it's really a lot about like nuance because like even even us the ones talking right now um i'm personally non-binary i'm from the province and then i moved to manila um which is also it's it's already so different like so many layers of that are already present personal experiences it is what led me here um so it's really 
multi-layered, multifaceted. <laughs> like, yeah. We're not just one thing. You know, like you can't distill everything that we've lived personally into just like a term. Like that's so reductive. You know, that's why I really, I really feel like Filipinex is such a diaspora term. Like I really do, believe, you know, it's, it's, I get the necessity of it here. You really have to have these little like terms so that you know what work on the ground. Mm -hmm. So you have a language that's primarily where, which is really necessary here, right? If you're, if you're someone that comes from a marginalized community, because if you don't, then you're not going to get resources. You're not going to get healthcare. You're not going to get, you know, LGBTQ centers that like help young queer kids who have nowhere to go. Like you're not going to get all those kind of services if you don't have the action, you know, or the organization. And it's hard to do that when you don't have the language or the terms to to have those like signifiers. What's interesting actually also is that in the Philippines, parang, we also have those kinds of instances eh, with regards to terms. Like we really have such mm. a weird relationship with labels. Eh. Yung language mm. and yung people na waray, it's not actually supposed to be waray because mm. that's a derogatory term for them. That's like, waray means wala. You actually call them binisaya. You call the language binisaya because waray is offensive, it's not correct, it's not representative of the people. Pero tayo, like, as people who bite into the mainstream, whatever we know, whatever information lang we have easy access to, we call them waray. Kasi yun yung alam natin, hindi tinuturo na mali pala yun. So, alam yun, parang it's not just, it's not just Filipinex that uh, we have an issue with as a label and as an identity. Even in the Philippines, sobrang dami na. Hindi lang siya mm. international problem ng mga Pilipino. It's very much rooted also in our lived experiences here that we don't actually get to talk, we don't get to understand each other and we're so quick to decide nga on the agree or disagree because we don't listen. We just talk to talk, we talk to argue, we don't talk to understand. Would you say our, what we use Filipino. Would you say it's as inclusive as we think? Do you think other regions of the Philippines feel included by this term? Or would you say this is more of like a mindset that's strictly manilenio? Uh, I feel like, I know eh, um, it's also such a complex thing kasi, um, yun nga, uh, internally ang um, struggle na talaga yung relationship natin with identity. So like, I feel like, um, I'm, I see it as Filipino is an umbrella term, but it does not encapsulate or talk about or really give us an idea of the specific experiences that mm -hmm. are packed into that term. So for example, um, I think, and some friends who are from Cebu have told me about this now, um, they think that um, Filipino communicates largely a Manila-centric experience. So parang for them, when we talk about Filipino, we don't actually talk about the multitude of experiences that Filipino should encompass. So it's kind of like um, using Filipino to refer to our language as a nation, but in fact it's actually multiple languages that we have. So, um, and Filipino as we know it is also largely Tagalog-centric, it's Tagalog-based. So parang si tingin ko, um, there has to be, uh, if we're already engaging uh, language critically, there also has to be a recognition and the critical um, thinking na Filipino itself isn't as, ex as inclusive as we think it is. So it's really just a simple way to communicate na this is the general context that I come from and then you go deeper from that. So parang sa akin, it's important for us ourselves um, as people who are from the archipelago, to be able to understand that hindi karanasan ng lahat ang karanasan natin. It's not everyone who experiences the experiences we have. We have different um, cultures. We also have different privileges. It's very intersectional. So I get why some people would not use the label Filipino to refer to themselves. I'm curious about your experiences using the term Filipino or Philippine X or um, whichever. I'm not aware of it feeling uninclusive. The point in which it feels kind of not inclusive is when you start talking about gender or when you start, you know, and in those circles, you know, and which which brings up the Philippine the Philippinex 
conversation. But I think like Filipino as a whole, I don't think us Filipinos here in the States are as aware of, you know, some of the issues that Adrian was, was mentioning a while ago. Um, but I also feel like, you know, so much of like how language is used here is is used to deal with oppression. You know what I mean? And like, I think, I think mm. when we talk about something like Filipinex, it really strikes at the heart of the issue of identity. Who really should be leading the conversation of do I do I think that do I feel include you know do I feel like the term Filipinex is inclusive? Yeah. Like I would default that to folks who are actually non-binary and who and how I would love to hear like how they feel that they are either included or in that or not. I actually do have friends who are um, Filipinex in the U.S. and they mentioned na parang for for non-binary people talaga, they are actually, parang Filipinex non-binaries actually tell cis Filipinex not to use Filipinex or to be at least more aware of like why they're using the term anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's actually like also that micro struggle kumbaga for the, for the non-binary people, which I didn't know kasi diba parang that's like the whole thing, ah? you're trying to make the whole language, the terms, the labels more gender neutral. But then you suddenly have people using it parang willy nilly in from how I uh oh yeah, from how I observed it also, it became sort of it there wasn't really a full contextualization nga of like the use why the term exists ganyan but to understand that there's actually an effort in the part of non-binary people to use it is parang it it helps you understand better why the term exists in the first place eh? na parang i feel like part of why it's such an incendiary conversation kumbaga is because we don't really hear the conversation come from non-binary folks. It might be largely cis people or it might also be my assumption that they're cis when they might not be. So parang I'm not really privy also to the whole um to the whole debate online because I don't really try to engage those spaces kapag ka debate siya. I try to get at people who have the experience and ask them, so what's the context for this? Cause also cause that makes me Parang that allows me to understand what's happening in a space that doesn't endanger my mental health. Because that's really what online debates are these days. But like for some of my friends to talk about how, yeah, actually, parang it's it's really difficult and harmful for us as non as non-binary folks to see people like just easily trash this uh, this label when in fact kami, we have our own efforts to try to get people to use it more parang about more conscientiously i guess and more to reflect na parang this label exists to give voice and to give a term for experiences that don't have that in the languages we have today parang ganon it's really something that we need to talk more about and to get to know each other not just talk to each other but with um so you know, again, I'm really grateful for the both of you. Thank you for spending your time and presence here with us. Um, and I also hope that, you know, whoever, you know, if you're watching this, whichever time and place you're from, I hope that you also learn something and puts into perspective your own, you know, sense of identity because it's not, it can't be boiled down to just whether we're Philippine X or not. So is there, is there anything that you'd like to promo? So, um, medyo dads kami ngayon, but uh, do check out our page, Usapang Lalaki. So, it's the one with the nice logo, not the other weird misogynistic pages. Uh, we actually, usually, outside pandemic, and even during the pandemic, we hold discussions and conversations about things that people don't really talk about. So, we try to unpack the context, uh, the different issues of like toxic masculinity, the patriarchy, gender roles. Um, and relationships and interactions with different people. So um, it's this kind of space also. We really try to get at what each other are really experiencing um, face to face in real life, what were the, uh, what the differences between us are and what our similarities are. And we try to uh, make sure that everyone at least learns a little bit more about people around them so that they can also understand more about themselves and maybe we can try to fix whatever is wrong with 
our relationships as people now. So um, our previous conversations actually have been recorded uh, and documented. So it's not videos, it's usually just um, text. You can find it on the page and we've discussed a variety of issues from call-out culture to um, toxic masculinity to community and self-care. So yeah, uh, the link I think is facebook.com slash usapanglalaki DYP. Plugs, 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 plugs. Oh, so as I mentioned earlier, or like as Chloe mentioned earlier in the bio, I'm, I'm involved with this theater called Bindle Stiff Studios, and our main goal is to preserve Filipino and Filipino American arts and culture and stories. And so um, through that, I'm a part of an all Asian American female comedy troupe called Granny Cart Gangstas. And on November 7th, we're going to be live streaming a show. Um, it's going to be sketch comedy. We're going we're gonna to have some stand-ups. It's very it's very Pinai heavy and in content and in everything and in energy. So it's gonna be online. So I invite you guys to come check that out. If, if you have time, November 7th at 7 p.m. our time here, um, Pacific Standard Time. And it'll be right after our very much anticipated election. So the mood of the show is either, is gonna be very, whew, interesting because we do a lot of political commentary it's like it's very it's just like our collective it's we're trying to laugh at this crazy world that we're all living in and so i invite you all to to join that if you're free and thank you so much and i can't wait to keep these conversations going i'm so happy to be a part of this you know break a leg as they <laughs> say in theater i know that haha <laughs> thank you Okay. Thank Aww. you so much. I learned a lot today. <laughs> wow. I know, me too. I <laughs> love the, it. Salamat y'all. Just simmering in it. Like, nice. Let's keep listening. Let's keep discussing. You know, getting to know each other is one of the best ways to figure stuff out. Community. See you in the next episode, Underdogs. This has been your host, Chloe. Remember to stay in love, stay in laugh. Stay in life.